<laughs> I have a slide for that. <laughs> yeah, so, okay, you already introduced yourself in the morning. I'm Veronica. I'm from Argentina. I'm a researcher there. And I do remote sensing and GIS applications for disease ecology. Um, so I'm also part of the grass development team, but I mostly, uh, let's say, a bothersome user always reporting things. <laughs> uh, so there, are, there is our contact information like GitHub account, Twitter, and emails in case then you have questions or want to contact with us. Um, so the material is available online. Yeah. Yeah, if you want to just check. <clears throat> I open it again so you see it. This presentation is in my GitHub account. This is the repo, Grass Open Hub 2019. And here, this first one, brief intro to Grass His, to Grass GIS, is the presentation that we will see just now. So I just, let's start then. Um, Grass GIS stands for Geographic Resources Analysis Support System. It's a FOSS, for, it's a FOSS GIS, so free and open source software GIS. Uh, it's used for geospatial data management and analysis, image processing, graphics, and maps production, uh, spatial modeling, and visualization. It is used in academic and commercial settings all around the world, and also by many governmental agencies and consulting companies. It was originally developed by the US Army, Army uh, the CERL laboratories, as a tool for land management and environmental planning. So it dates back to 80s, right? It's the longest standing uh, uh, yeah, free and open source software uh, GIS. <clears throat> this is, we won't reproduce it, <laughs> but here uh, we leave you this very nice video. Uh, it's, um, how do you say, related by, no, not related, but um, this, the speaker is Christian Slot, Slaughter? Christ no, William. William. William Slaughter, the one from um, Star Wars. Star Wars. Okay, Captain Kirk. Yeah. Yeah, and you, you, you see how the, the, the maps load in these very old computers, like these kind of boxes, and then but line by line the map is displaying and such. But the problems that they addressed are the same problems that we address every day in GIS. And so it's very nice. It's still like a very nice geek video to see. Um, it's 15 minutes long, so we won't reproduce it here, but then you can have a look at it. So what, are, what would be the advantages and disadvantages of using GRASS-GIS? First, the advantages, it's open source, okay, like R, the same. Um, you can use it, you can modify, you can improve it, you can share it. Uh, it has a strong user community and also commercial support, so there are companies also working with the software, developing new modules and providing service, like providing um, yeah, the service to other companies, yeah, to s maintain the software, the installations and such, or do processing for them. Um, there, are a, there is a large amount of tools, more than 500 tools plus plugins. Um, it provides both, both a GUI, like a graphical user interface, and a command line interface, which makes it super easy for scripting. <clears throat> and there are uh, Python APIs and libraries that also allow this link with Python, as Marcus was commenting in the morning. Disadvantages, um, or maybe not disadvantages, but some drawbacks. Uh, did any of you ever try to open GRASS-GIS and succeed it? 
good. <laughs> Two out of 20. <laughs> well, not so bad. Well, you have noticed then that this startup is pretty complicated. Like, you're like, what is this? Why do I have to check this? Uh, sometimes it's in red and so on. Um, but we will go through that, and then hopefully you will open Grass and do your stuff, do your analysis in Grass. Um, then the other thing is that you that Grass has a native format, also as Marcus was telling. Then you need we need to import data into Grass, yes, or uh, link link the data to Grass. Um, and also, this is seen as, as a disadvantage maybe in the beginning because when you try to import, let's say, a shape file, uh, if the shape file fa shape, uh, sorry, is if the shape file is a bit messy, then since Grass is a topological GIS, uh, the things get a bit complicated. Okay, and maybe it takes a lot of runs to get the topology right. But Yeah, so it's there like in the disadvantages column, but then once you start using it, you really you realize how good it is to have all these check checkups at the beginning and these corrections at the beginning because then you are sure that your data is fine and you can go with all the processing. <clears throat> now when to use grass? Well I would I highly recommend using RAS when doing heavy geospatial data analysis or processing, um, especially when doing raster processing. There are tons of modules there and also for, land, for um, satellite imagery. When working with topological vector data, as we, as we just said, um, it's also great for analyzing space-time data sets. As there are three <laughs> other talks about uh, space-time processing in GRASS.js, so don't miss them. Um, then you can also do when doing Python scripting or when deploying server-side applications, Exam for example, as a WPA's PS process. So you have run, uh, you have GRASS running in the, in the, in the backend. When to use rather something else, well, when, if you only want to visualize a map, yeah, then just use something else because it's like maybe a lot of work to just import the data and check the data and so on, just if you want to visualize a quick visualization. And of course, if you are scared of location and map set, and we will see what's that, okay? Now, in the end, Working with GRASS-GIS is not much different than any other GIS, except for this, okay? Um, so this is what you see when you try to start GRASS. Um, we have this kind of uh, database structure where we are asked for a database directory, a location, and a map set, and only after we chose those, we, have to, we can start GRASS. We will see just now what all those directories mean. So the grass database, the first row in the startup, is just an existing directory that will contain all our data, all our grass data. So there we import all our data. And inside that, 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 that main or root directory, we will have locations. Yeah. This is the thing here, I will show you again. Yeah, okay, grass data, like the root directory, then we have locations. Those locations are defined by the coordinate uh, reference system. Okay, so within each location then, all our data 
we are sure that it has the same coordinate reference system. <clears throat> and within locations, we have map sets or that are just subdirectories within the locations. And it, they can also be called like projects, for example. Or, yeah, this is like the traditional naming scheme for this directory structure. But it's basically directories within directories within directories. Um, and in map sets, we can organize them however we want. So usually, for example, what we do is uh, we put the name of the coordinate system to the location, and then within the location to the map sets, you can put, I don't know, the type of data you are working, like LST or NDVI, or the area you are working, like st your study area. So you just organize them or name them as you want. But uh, okay, within <laughs> one more detail, within every location, there's always a permanent map set, like permanent in caps. Um, and that permanent map, map set is the one storing the information about the coordinate uh, system, the regions, the boundaries, and such. And we use it just to store like our base maps, for example, or the data that it's not supposed to change. So I don't know, borders, county borders, rivers, uh, roads, and things like that. <clears throat> so the, it looks something like this, then the root directory, the grass data, then the locations, okay? Um, and then inside each location, you have the permanent map set, and then you have other map sets that you cr can create and import your data into. And then, so this is what we see when we start. And the thing is, grass needs this path to start. So it needs the grass data, where is it, and which location, and in which map set you will start the, the program, the software. And then within each map set, you have all the data. So you will have raster, vector data, 3D raster, and the temporal data. But yeah. So basically, you shouldn't modify this yourself, only within GRASS. Because, for example, a raster map, it's not only one file, but it will have like the data, then the color table, then the nulls file, and I don't know how many other files. So you are not supposed, I mean, to not mess it up, you are not supposed to just, unless you really know what you're doing, but as, yes. But then, sorry, no, no, go. So if you have a GIS which uh, does on the fly reprojection, you have to rely on what they have implemented, or you go into the settings and change it yourself, and then the advantage is quite uh, small. So yeah. since sometimes it has been decided one location is one CRS, and that's it, but you can reproject them. Yeah, we'll come to these advantages in a moment. So then, why this structure? As I said before, because of the native format for raster and vector data. And then they must be imported or linked into a grass location map set. <clears throat> and what are the advantages? Well, all these um, folders, all these structure, um, since they are just normal folders, 
can be easily shared with others. Okay, and you can have it. You can have them locally, or it can be like in a remote system to which different users can access. Because also, since they are folders, you can get you can set different permissions to each folder, and then everyone will have access to permanent map set, and then each user can have his or her own map set. Um, and then, as Marcus was saying. All data in a location have necessarily the same C uh, coordinate reference system. And then you forget about the problems when, uh, of, over, of non-overlapping maps when you want, for example, to extract values uh, from a raster up to a vector. And they were reprojected on the fly and you didn't even know. So with this, you are very conscious of that. you reproject or import with reprojection on the fly. But, but you know... I need to reproject. No, you cannot, unless there's reprojection on the fly and you don't know, as QGIS does or many others. Yeah. Trust no. is a lot about data quality and quality assurance and so on. Um, it's not easily allowed to do tricks. No. Uh, it can be, of course, but in my view, it should not be so. And that's why this mechanism is there. Yeah. Yeah, so for me, it was really changing, like mind changing, because you are really conscious of what you are doing. So you, you don't let like others decide for you. It's just that you know what you're doing. So which is the system of this data and so on? Which system do I want to work according to what analysis I want to do and such? what your target CRS yeah. is. And then often it's the case that you don't work with just one CRS, right? So you have different data sets. So then my end product of that project is certain um, data set or whatever that has a different coordinate reference system. So then I need to move that to another location, another folder with the same, then I need to import that to a different project. But Where do we interact? We, you you reproject, yes. No, no, sorry. So, this is just the point. No data, no problem. So we are discussing at time at this level here. Yeah? This is, for example, North Carolina State Plain metric uh, provision. By the way, in US, there are plenty, there are fees, there are different fees. In, different, in the same state, you have three different provisions. So that easily happens there. This one is US Albers, for example. This is latitude and longitude. Yeah. So at location level, you have the different provisions here. And if you have a width of different uh, CRS to deal with, yeah, you kind of do the job of getting it cleaned up in the beginning while you are importing into these locations. Yeah. So to if you decide my, I don't know, we are in Europe here, uh, the European uh, EPFG 3035, the number uh, azimuthal area, which is the standard EU one, is your friend, could be, or you have the UTM something zone, and the other come in gauss Boaga, Gauss-Krüger, Gauss, I don't know what other, Kroger, whatever, projection, while you import you into this... Uh, into your target uh, CRS. For example, yeah, it does the reprojection. And then you are settled because everything is nicely clean. Yeah. If you have to deliver then later into a different one, you have to do what you were telling, you have to reproduce Reproject. that one. But at least the entire uh, uh, processing of data analysis and so on is done on the same CRS, which I would also recommend to other, other users. Uh, yeah. <laughs>
Well, then um, we move on. Uh, we can handle different types of data in GrassGIS, raster, of course, including satellite image, imagery that are also rasters, 3D raster or voxel vectors, yeah, like point, line, boundary, area, phase. Uh, and we have this, since a couple of years, this new type of data, uh, the space-time data sets that are collections of rasters or raster 3D or vector maps. And since... Saturday, we also support or will support <laughs> image collections as well. So we will be able to have also um, time series of image collections. No, it's grass format. You import it. So then we have uh, the modules, and there are more than, as I told you, 500 modules, but they are like well-structured. So the idea with GRASS is this modularity um, yeah, toolbox. So following Linux uh, paradigm kind of uh, tools to do ta simple tasks, um, so it's modular structure. Um, and they are organized according to their functionality to what we use them for, or which is the input data. So, for example, all modules starting with G are for general data management, and, for example, you have G rename, so to rename maps. Um, all the D for display, all the R for raster, the I for imagery, and so on. And then, <clears throat> okay, this is how you can see them in the... GUI, there is a tab for modules, and you can see them uh, there. You can display like uh, more modules there, or you have them all there in the main menu. <clears throat> and also do some searching. And then we have like a lot of plugins or add-ons, we call them add-ons, uh, and they can be installed from a centralized repository uh, now in GitHub with all the add-ons, but we can also install add-ons from like other developers or even if you de if you want to develop one add-on for Grass and you put it in your repo, uh, we can also install that using this we, this module called G Extension. So then, if we want to install an extension, we just do G Extension and the name of the extension, or if we are installing some uh, add-on from another developer, not in the OSGEO repository, we just put the URL for that, uh, for that add-on. So this, this like widens the possibilities of installing extensions. <clears throat> and then these are some very important <laughs> concepts uh, in GRASS.js already when we are working there the computational region, and this mainly affects the raster processing. So computational region um, is defined by boundaries, yes, and by the resolution. So we have this raster map extent and resolution, like covering the whole map, but maybe we don't want to work in the whole map, just a simple, a smaller subset of that. and then the computational region comes in. We just, um, I don't know if some of you did the cubes, uh, the GDAL cubes um, workshop yesterday, so it was, it was similar. There we were doing like a cube um, reduction or subset, but this is similar, okay? We just set the boundaries 
and the resolution, and then all the output raster maps will have that, uh, those boundaries and that resolution that we set. So we can set it like manually, or we can set it to the extents of a vector, and we can align it to a certain raster map. Okay. Yes. I mean, then, of course, the default um, the the default sum, uh, subsampling for that or resampling for that will be nearest neighbor. So, a uh, modis pixel of 500 meters will be divided in 30 meters squares pixels. No. Yeah, unless you do. Yeah, unless you do downscaling and creaking and so on. So just to give you an idea why this is an advantage. Um, it comes later. Some confusion sometimes, but for example, the SRTM global 30 meter elevation model, which is heavy, that's 200 something gigabyte high, with some millions of pixels, but you only want to compute in MEN stuff. So why bother with all the other data around? You set the computational region to this area of interest, and you do the computation, and it goes like this. Nonetheless, the, uh, the base map is huge. <clears throat> Yeah, there's not everything there. Just a tiny fraction of what graph can do. Yeah. It comes with a nice QGIS interface. We also like that. But um, you cannot access everything. You yeah. can register missing commands yourself. It's just an ASCII description file internally, uh, which then generates automatically this uh, user interface. But still, it's only a fraction of what you can do. Yeah, it for example, yeah. all the time series modules are not there. Yeah, you that's what I. Then you write uh, for the module you want to see there, which is not there. Some I can show you later. Some ASCII file, uh, which should, in my view, also be auto generated, like you do for the GUI, because the graph GUI is also automatically generated on the fly. Um, but we will discuss with the yeah. details. One okay. <laughs> it doesn't do all the functionality which R offers. For sure, that's why we have the grass R interface in two directions. But uh, try PCA, so principal component analysis or regression on a larger data set. Just click and then see. Yeah. Stuff. Yeah, so shall I go? No. Yeah, you just <laughs> step a bit into the presentation. Now, which are the advantages of the computational region then? It keeps uh, your results consistent. Avoid clipping maps. So you just change the area, subset the area. Don't have to clip maps and uh, duplicate data. Uh, you can, since you can uh, subset this or put this region in different places, you can fine tune different uh, processings. Um, and you can run different processes in different areas as well. And if you need like more details, then I put several links in the presentation so you can check more info. Another another concept is uh, or important thing in Grass is the mask. So here, mask is also like it's a raster, but it can be created also from a vector. Um, and the important thing is like it's it's virtual mask. You j you don't need to clip the maps that you will use with the mask. You just like we call it apply the mask. So we use a command called our mask, and either from a raster or from a vector, we can set this mask, and then all the processing afterwards will be like affected by that mask. Okay. <clears throat> So, for example, um, 
if we use this vector of lakes to set a mask, then all the area within the vectors um, will be like processed and the rest not, or we can set the inverse mask and then all the rest of the area we will process, but not the lakes. Yeah. Is this a temporary structure or is it a new location for this map? This is map set specific. So if you set a mask uh, while working on a map set, it will affect only the processings in that map set and only for raster data. And then in a different map set, you can set a different mask. And then you, you just remove it as well. So it oh, looks like this. Map is a map. It's a map. Yep. It's a raster called mask in cups. Okay. If it is called mask in cups, then it is treated like this virtual mask. So if you, you give your elevation model the name mask, then you will be surprised if it has that. Yeah. So you can set it from a vector. Like this is the inverse mask. Here we only see the legs. Here we see all the rest because we use this inverse flag. Or we can use a raster and we say, okay, from this raster map only mask the class five through seven. Or we can create our raster called a raster called mask in cups, uh, for example, from the elevation map. Okay, so if elevation is uh, below 100, put one, otherwise null. And like that, the mask is automatically set because you are creating this raster. And then to remove it, you just do R mask minus R. It's two different things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the region you can also change as you want with a command called G dot region. With that, you set uh, the boundaries, you set the resolution, and you can change it how many times you want. And it's also map set specific. Um, does the particular region have to be a binding box, like BB box? It's a BB box. It's a BB. Be a, let's say, a irregular shape? No. No, it will take the boundaries of the, the... It will... Yes. Yeah, if you set if you set it to a if you set it to a vector, then it will take the most extreme borders of that vector to set the bounding box. And then if you don't want the places in between, let's say it's a circle, you just set a mask. So they work like in combination. <clears throat> then in grass we have different interfaces. Um, so this is how the GUI looks like when you open Grass. Um, we have this layer manager here and several tabs. So we have a basic command line there, uh, the module tree that I showed you before, also a data tree, like to browse uh, data that you have in the Grass data folder. And there's also a simple Python shell as well. And then the map display with different uh, functionalities there, like different zoomings options, uh, decorations, 3D view, digitalization, and so on. <clears throat> and this is the third window that appears when we open Grass, the command line. So this will run, if in Linux, it will run Bash. If in Windows, it will be PowerShell. Um, we like it very much <laughs> because it's like faster uh, to type commands there and that's it without doing so much clicking. Um, it has also several advantages like you can run uh, the command history there and there you see all your previous commands. So this history is stored also per map set and then in each map set you will have all the history of commands that you have run. So that make, makes the processing pretty reproducible and, and transparent. <clears throat> uh, you can search in the history with Control R. You can save this history to a file and then polish it a bit and create a script out of it. <clears throat> and from there, you can also call the GUI of all the modules and copy the command. If you don't like the command line, you just 
can do all the clicks in the GUI of each module, and then you have a button to copy how the command would look like after you did all the clicks and the things you wanted to do. So for beginners, that's also useful because then you can copy and reproduce your workflow afterwards and not forget like all the clicks that you did. <clears throat> With PowerShell command, yes. It's with Bash or, or the or the or the shell you have, yes. Then uh, there's this interface with Python. There are two libraries, two Python libraries delivered with Grass GIS, Grass and PyGrass, um, that provide access to modules and to internal C functions. And then there are there is uh, one external library called Grass Session that Marcus was mentioning this morning as well. And they can all be combined and integrated well with Jupyter Notebooks, for example. So we can write our processings in Jupyter Notebooks as well. This is how the simple Python editor, the um, Python tab looks like. And this is the, how the simple Python editor looks like. So they already import what you need there, and then you can here write your commands. Okay, and you get this one pressing this button. <laughs> or you can just write your Python script in your favorite ed editor and run it, or use this grass session that uh, Marcus was uh, showing before. <clears throat> then, as it was mentioned before, you can use grass from QGIS. You can either use the Grass GIS plugin. That means that from QGIS, you have access to your Grass data and your locations or map sets. And then you call uh, Grass modules there and work with the QGIS interface. So you can also have the shell there, the command line there. Or you use the processing toolbox, like for your data outside Grass, like TIFF and shapefiles and such, you can apply Grass GIS functionality. <clears throat> so this would be like using the plugin and this would be like using processing toolbox. Then there's also interface with, uh, with R through the R Grass 7 uh, library in Grass package. And again, two, two ways of using it, like you can use R within Grass, like you are in the shell in the command line of grass, you type R and R comes out, uh, or R Studio, and you get R Studio, and then the sessions are connected, so you can see uh, in which location and map set and which projection you are, and then you can just read the data into R, uh, do some analysis, do some plottings, and so on. And then if you get some output, you can also write back to, uh, to grass. Or you can just, without starting Grass, you start your R Studio if you feel more comfortable like that, and just from R Studio or R or whatever interface you use for R, you can uh, initialize Grass and use the, uh, its modules. <clears throat> so it looks, I don't know if it, you see, but for example, here you call R Studio, and here you get the R and it's connect, you load the library and then you see that it's connected uh, to the session in Grass. So it has all the information about the Grass data location map set and so. Yeah. Yes, yes. Simple features. Yeah. Yeah, we will see that. So uh, one of the, my presentations, I think it's on Thursday, we will use like the grass temporal framework and then connect to R and we will use, we will import vector data and raster data into R and then do some modeling in R. So we will see this, this connection further. <clears throat> then WPS, uh, web processing services, you can use uh, grass commands in a simple way through the web. And then there's also Actinia, which is the call by Mark, the call, <laughs> the talk by Marcus as well these days, 
tomorrow, I think. Right. Um, if you want to tell something. Yeah. Um, I don't know if any one of you is familiar with the right. We should. Go to the talk. Basically, uh, the, uh, a REST API around GraalGIS and also Lida and other stuff. This REST API stuff I will introduce uh, tomorrow. And uh, the idea is that you can deploy it all in a cloud infrastructure uh, with different workers. And then from where you are, you send out your request to the cloud and let do the processing that happen there. It is distributed, you can run in parallel. You can imagine you chunk your big data into small pieces with tiling. You send out the tiles to the cloud and it does something and it expects the result. It's, by the way, a geo community project, um, open source and yeah, we will see. Yeah, importantly, you can use the same commands that you use in your grass desktop version. Just you add only like a flag uh, and it's sent out to the cloud. So it's, if you are used to grass commands, then it's super easy should be super easy. <laughs> okay, this will skip. How to get some help? Just don't panic. Yeah. yeah just a really tiny question. Why is REST would be better than using Google Engine? Well, Google Engine is not open source. Apart from that, I don't know, just could ask it. Yeah, this is a more complex talk. Um, the thing is that we are uh, having also here together with uh, Münster uh, the Open EO Horizon project. And that's a kind of, uh, let's say, the, the you have heard about it already? Yes. OK, so you know everything about uh, that means standardization of API and then having different backends. The idea is to get away from this uh, specific cloud vendor stuff, but to get to something generic so that you can also choose among your cloud provider. One yeah. day. And Google Engine is doing great stuff, but it is one of them. Maybe there are different as well, and so our idea is to standardize it all and have it then as a different backend in order to get rid of any dependency. Yeah. yeah, you also don't know when Google will stop it or start charging for it, charging for it. So I think it's better to be or try to be independent of that. No vendor lock in. Um, Well, there you have like different ways of getting help uh, for grass modules like G manual and the name of the module will provide you with the manual for each module or typing minus minus help or minus minus H while you type your module then it gives you a short version of the manual. We have a grass wiki full of examples, explanations, uh, descriptions of workflows and such, many tutorials. Uh, then there's also a collection of U Jupyter or IPython notebooks with some workflows, some examples. And you can, of, of course, subscribe to the GRASS user mailing list uh, and post your question. Or also, of course, check the archives because probably your question was answered some time ago. And if you are still more cu curious, there's a link to the source code and the history of each module, like the changes that this module have suffered through the time, at the end of each manual page. So you can directly access the source code and check what it's doing. And I'm done, it's your turn. <laughs> Is there any other question for this part or better let's go to... Yeah, we are in the team. He is the chair of the project. <laughs> yeah, we will go through it. Um, okay, some references. One question. Um, but all your data has to be in the graph database. Does that mean that it always makes them, um, that, you, that you always have your data to, 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 to something? Because it makes a copy to the... 
Yes and no. Problem? It depends, um, yeah. Well, it, there are two ways. Especially with raster data, you can uh, also just link those data live into the graph's uh, location or mm -hmm. concept. And then graph believes it is a graph map, but indeed it is somewhere else and it's only a link to it. Um, this is then avoiding this kind of issue. And some extra metadata are generated around your story about the length of the floating point data. You can do the same with vector data as well, but uh, since it is a change from non topological to topological vector data, this is something which is not that uh, immediate and probably not within the convention. Mm. But for raster data, we often use the linking instead of duplicating the. Yeah, especially when it's a very huge map. And how many Windows users are there? Because there is the graph that comes, the histology, the graph, there is the graph that comes, so it's go. Yeah. So we recommend, yeah. uh, for Windows users, we do recommend the OGO for Windows installer. Yeah. Because, um, and I would even recommend to save this installer, it's not very big, uh, on your disk for next time. Because running it again, yeah, it fetches all updates. Now that's yeah. a nice advantage. Um, and you don't bother with all the dependencies, it does it by itself. If you are so if you are Windows mm -hmm. user, I get it. Okay. please go here. OK, you download this installer and run it, uh, execute it as an administrator. And then here are like, this is all uh, um, the summary of steps. And then I have like developed with screenshots how it should go. Uh, then you check here for the grass package if you want also QGIS, but you check there for grass, and then you set also Matplotly, Python SciPy, Python Py, Python Pli, and such. <laughs> MSCs, and then it runs. So it, it, it will bring all the dependencies and install everything and set everything for you, and then when you want to update, you just run the setup again, and it will bring the new stuff. Uh, where was exactly the presentation? So if you go to, uh, no, it's in the, I put a link here in my GitHub, where the, present, the first presentation is, uh, software installation guide. And you click there, and there's the installation. It's from an old course I taught, but it's reusable. <laughs> no, it's just because um, it's just because for for example, writing a four or things like that, it's much easier if we can use like bash kind of commands for especially for me i don't know how to really write for and things like that in windows and then yeah my github vero andreo Do you read? I can put it in a text file. Yeah. There you have it. Just go a couple of slides further. <laughs> Because it's the 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 front page is for a course, an old course. Okay, so now I leave you with Marcus. 
Just one more thing, if you are interested in some other courses and, and tutorials, these are very nice uh, courses, introductory and from introductory to advanced, um, that I leave you here the, the links. So if you are interested in seeing some more, they're like, um, I don't know, they use with Python, PyWPS, and time series, and many things in those links. So you can have a look. <clears throat> and now you should go, if you are in the presentation, move to Marcus' presentation. Here's the link. OK. Um, so this is, I know you don't see it, the landing page. Wait, I will just put it. A separate window. So you find the courses here. Can you read that? GitLab, not GitHub today. I have repos on both vendors, but the GitLab pages are much easier to maintain, for me at least. And there you will find um, the, fir the second entry, the first entry is for tomorrow. Second entry is this course here. So back to your question, uh, which version to take on Windows? The OSGEO for Windows in the long run is much easier to maintain because with the standalone you have to go there, get a new standalone package, install it, blah, blah. And with the OSGEO for Windows, you just go next, 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 and you are done. Uh, that's the main advantage. And of course, you do the installation of QGS, and if you want that, or Map Server, or GeoServer, or so many others, uh, with the same tool, the generic installer of OSGEO. But the grass version is the grass version. Yeah, that is all. So there are not no huge. There are no differences. So we already got the introduction. Uh, I think I can skip at this point. Is the font large enough for you, or do you want it like this? Better? Good. I believe that we can skip the first part here, uh, because we already discussed it, but you will find it in the material. So first part is actually, uh, no, where is it? With this large font size, it's hard to see. Yeah. Okay, it would be what we have seen here. So surprisingly, a few uh, pieces of material are uh, identical. The only thing, just to re uh, recall it once more, here's the grass world, and here's the rest of the world, like vector raster, whatever you have. And this direction is import, that direction is export. Pretty obvious, but still just to remind you. Ah, what we also didn't mention so far, uh, if you are in, an, in, a, in a team, this is all, uh, this you can use in a team. Now you put it on a network device in your institute, for example, or your company, or what you have, and then multiple users can use the same uh, structure. It's even a good idea because then you have, for example, the base cartography uh, like elevation model, street network, whatsoever. You put into these uh, permanent map sets here. Yeah, and then they are available to all users. And the users, they can share the location and each user works in his or her own map set. And you can then regulate if the others can see that map set or not. So that is quite nice for uh, research groups. Uh, because you really avoid a mess that everybody thinks to have the latest elevation model, but probably it's not true. You only, only have one copy, that is the official one, and so on. Or, for example, autophotos, they can be quite heavy. Um, like in this federal state of Germany, the autophotos are freely available, 10 centimeter resolution for channels. Uh, this state is 30,000 square kilometers. Now you can imagine how much disk space you need if you want to keep it all. And you really want only one copy of that and not 
that everybody comes and does his or her own private stuff. So shared directory in a network is, um, is possible here. Okay, uh, I don't know if you downloaded the data we need here. Did you? Very good. So the download link is on the first page, course data download. Uh, we are using uh, uh, elevation file here. We are using already a prepared location. What you have to do, maybe you have already done, to unzip it uh, somewhere. Um, in this presentation, I always refer to, let's say, Unix style, that is uh, Linux or Macintosh, with home directory. Uh, the Windows user, I didn't want to clutter everything with, if on Windows, then do this. Yeah, you can just uh, use, I don't know, documents or where you usually put your data. Maybe uh, there's a better name than for that. Um, and do the same. So we want two folders. One is called geodata. In this, we un extract the geotiff file. And we want a, a, a folder called grass data, which carries uh, the already prepared grass location. Or are you already done with that? Then, yes? Cool. Question? Yes. No, you have one grass data folder. So I did one some 20 years ago, which I'm moving from one machine to the next. Um, and you have the locations therein. So this you need to do one time only in theory. I just want to get this uh, screen mirrored. I don't remember how to do it. Do you know how to mirror the screen? Hmm? All right, good idea. So easy. Okay, so um, we assume that you are there. And now we start with the, the first step. Now I have to do it myself. Okay, this was of course wrong because this I told to put into geodata. Okay. You can already see here that this uh, ECAT uh, database contains different raster data. Yeah, I just ex extracted it here. And now I will bring up grass. And you can select here in the first place um, your grass data directory. And then you say open. And so it should already list, I have some more than you, already list uh, the locations. Do you have that? Yes. Yeah, you are right. Mm -hmm. 
permanent, I say in the tutorial. Yes, you can. Yeah. Um, okay, so I show this once more. So I leave um, the grass session. Let's say new day. Hmm? And you can just say go to grass data in this ACAT one permanent. So you specify grass database, location, map set. And when you start it, you are directly in, you bypass the welcome screen. This is what I normally do. I honestly don't even use the GUI, so I switch it off and do more or less everything on command line. Um, but you still have all the integration there. Uh, for example, we discussed like r.import, I just do a random command. If you uh, bring it up in the, sorry for these messages, we try to get rid of them, but just ignore them, no problem. Um, if you just launch it on the command line without any parameter, it brings up the GUI, the graphical user interface. And what um, so we had geodata somewhere. I don't know if you can see this. Don't do this. I just show you the uh, as an example what uh, Veronica was already explaining. We have here the menu structure, and down here you see the command line which is constructed. Yeah, because this window is generated on the fly by the parser. Who is interested in that? Uh, I can explain later. Uh, if you do copy, this copy button here, you copy this line to the command line and then you can go to your text editor, for example, and just paste it there. And so you have already the command line ready, which means to document things is super easy. And uh, despite that, we also have the history command. Yeah, it shows here what has happened so far. And if you can see, uh, look closely here, you see there's a vimport command. If you write history there, you will also see it. This is the command which I have executed some time ago when I was preparing it. So it carries the entire history with it. Our import I did today. The others I did uh, earlier, maybe some years ago. So you have already, always on a per map set base the entire documentation available. Um, so I do just another example just for your information this is um, another map set I have sorry another location and if I write history here you can see this is the list of the last 2500 commands I have done over the past years yeah, it's all there. I don't remember when I started this uh, this map set here, but it is pretty old. So I can just scroll back the entire history. So this I did probably when I was a student. Not sure, but um, you can just go back to, to the very beginning, which means Grass is automatically documenting everything. And this can be a lifesaver. You do a public publication, the thing goes to peer review, maybe it stays forever there, they come back with some question and you don't really remember what you have done. Um, with other GIS where you can only click, yeah, you, it's really tough to reconstruct. Here you have it all as a command line and you can go back and see, ah, it came from here, it came from there, and you will figure out what you have done to do your research or your analysis. 
There was another question. Okay, let's see. What I suggest uh, to the others, maybe you can simply go through uh, the tutorial. There was something about loading this uh, vector map here. Yeah, the, we are in the section analyzing the ECAD uh, climatic data. And you can maybe follow the steps so that we can circle around for questions. Okay, so I will just um, do what is happening here. With, if you have these, this message clutter there, with Control L, you can polish, at least on some operating systems, you can polish it. You remember we had the command families. So the generic commands, general commands are with G. Yeah, there are several of them, and they are doing all kind of generic stuff, like everything related to the uh, graphical user interface has been put there, copy, give access to colleagues or not, list things, show the manual, uh, remove, rename, and the region management, and so on. Okay, if I do type raster, we do not have any raster map yet there, but we do have a vector map. That is the the natural earth uh, 10 meter administrative boundaries level one. The one you have probably already displayed here. So the display is done with, uh, you can go through uh, here to file, map display and vector, if you prefer to go through the menu, or you use here this icon, which is called uh, add vector map layer, or there's a shortcut control shift V. Probably the shortcuts depend on the language. If you are not in English, there maybe it's different. Uh, this was decided by the translating committees to, or let the translating groups how to put that. All right, and then you pick the map. I have already, sorry, I have already done this. You get this dialog here. And if you re-click in the legend on it, you get the dialog again. So in case you want to, to uh, change something. For example, I go to colors and activate random colors here. Yeah, so uh, the map comes in random colors, surprisingly. Of course. So where are, where are you now? Since we are geospatial here, tell me where you are. The d does everybody see the GUI? Check. No? No. Avero, could you maybe give some support? What's the, the format of the vector? Vector format is again grass format because it's topological. <laughs> um, if you are, okay, I use this moment to give some ideas about it. We have a command which is called vinfo, which gives you vector information. So it does this very vintage style terminal output, but still it's not so bad. Um, you see a few things here. For example, that we have a level two. Level two means topology. Level one is not topology. We see here some statistics, how many polygons are there, and if you look closely, you see there are centroids and areas. And since we are in a topological model here, we have a vector line, but the line is uh, of type boundary. And to get a polygon, we have to put a centroid inside. And it's a major difference to the non-topological uh, GIS, which don't care much about that. Let's say boundaries plus centroids form the, the areas. And then we can also have islands. Islands are like holes, so there is no centroid inside. And internally, uh, it is all calculated with some pretty complex algorithm because you have to find left side, right side, and so forth. But luckily, it's open source, and you can 
look at it. And before I answer that question, there's a number of DB links, that is database links. Remember you have, your, no, sorry, not. Imagine you have a geometry, yeah, points, lines, polygons, whatever it is. 2D, 3D, by the way, we can also have 3D. Um, you can link it to attribute table. This is pretty standard in GIS, of course, but you can also link it to several attribute tables if you have to do that. And these attribute tables are by default in SQLite format, but they can also be in PostgreSQL, MySQL, or something else. And then eventually here we see the projection. We are currently, it's not really a projection, but anyway, latitude, longitude, and we have the bounding box here, and some comments can be there. And if you want to know how, how this map has been created with minus h, remember minus minus help gives you instructions. And here we see with minus h, print history instead of info. So I do it again. We see here the entire history, how this map has been created. And it was indeed an import from this website here. So it, oh, sorry, sorry. It codes, um, in the history, you have even the source coded in this case. I mean, I'm making use of a nice uh, GDAL OGR feature that you can retrieve data sources from the web. And then I call it in the GRASS database, I call it like this. And here are some things, especially this snap, you can even do topological fixing on the fly while you are importing. Imagine you import something, and unfortunately many data out there are broken somehow. Yeah, you can do a mi tiny snapping in order to fix uh, gap and sliver and things like that while you are importing. Pretty neat in my view. So here you can see when I have done it, and here you see what the statistics were. Total areas found are 8,500 something. And if there was a topological error still there, then you would see it here and would uh, say uh, there are two broken areas which are violate, violating uh, topology. For example, a shape like an, uh, like an 8 that is a self-intersecting polygon, not so nice to have, and uh, grass can take care of fixing that, but um, you have to explicitly tell so. Okay. Good. Yes, if you want to import through the command line. Um, let me go here, geodata, ecut. So to have the possibility to import, I don't have a vector map here. I show you first the export, okay? So we generate one, g.list. So now you will probably wonder, how do I manage by typing two characters to get the old command back? This is yet another advantage of the command line, at least on Unix-based systems. <laughs> you can type Control r and then it does a reverse search. Now I remember there was something with list, because I did glist vector, list, and it already comes up. I press return and I see it. So what I do now is, uh, because I just want to show import, I have to have a vector map. I don't have it here on this machine. I just export the map you have already seen into a geo package file. So input is the name in the GRASS database. Output is the name it will have in the file system. So it's now writing out that into the geo package file. You can even already type here and queue it, the command, for when it is finished. Voila. And so we have here our exported geo package file. It should be uh, identical to that which I got from uh, Natural Earth uh, data, but in case the original data were broken and you have fixed them in grass, now you would have the polished file. Data. So 
Yes, I, I did this. It's not very clever from a didactical point of view because I didn't have the file here on my computer. I had to do that. Forget about it. Uh, now uh, we have a new day. We have this data set here. And I want to import it. So I write v.import. Input is the name. Output is uh, the same name. For example, since I already have it, I call it 2. Otherwise, it will tell me it's already there. And I go. So now you see it is doing registering primitives, cleaning polygons, breaking polygons, remove duplicates, tangles, and so on and so on. So it does a lot of topological cleaning here while importing it. And this happens to any map you import, uh, any vector map you import. For us, we see it as a major advantage. Um, because then the data you have inside are clean. If they cannot be cleaned automatically, it will tell you, and it will also suggest uh, maybe you want to try snapping off this value, and then you try again. If it is totally messed up, then you have to go with different tools. There's, for example, the vclean tool, which is doing that. And here you can have a lot of, maybe you cannot read it, Break lines, snap, remove dangles, uh, change type of boundaries, remove bridges, and all the topological problems you can have in a vector file, you can address here. Yeah, okay, you also noticed that. If I want to do v.import, for example, you can use the tabulator key tab and it completes. If there is more than one, it will not do anything with one tab. It does nothing. You tap again and it gives you the choice. So that's a nice uh, shell feature. It's not grass driven, but it's just the command line. Yet another command line advantage. So to type things is pretty fast with that. And then with the reverse search, control i something with import, I can retrieve in no time the entire thing again. I don't have to hit enter. I could say uh, maybe next map geo package is, I can also do control k. There are some shortcuts I can show you to delete to the right new map. It's not there, so it will not work. But um, yeah, like this, you can do command line editing very quickly. And if you then write history, you have it all. Yes. Yes. So there are two commands. One is uh, v-import, no? and one is called vin.ogr. What is the difference? The v-import, maybe I just start them because then it's easier to understand. The v-import is a kind of simplified view of the real import tool. No, where is it? V import, okay. V import is a simplified view of the VR in OGR. V in OGR does everything. And here um, you also have the possibility to create an error map. No, sorry, it is done in the VClean. Um, the VClean, the topological cleaning, is able to write out an error map to only write out the broken part for inspection. Yeah, you can kind of separate the good from the bad. Yeah, in this case, I don't have a broken example here. Uh, the import will tell you there are two uh, or whatever amount of broken polygons, um, and then you have to work on that with they are clean, imported anyway, but then you go and import, uh, sorry, clean them with weekly so in a second step. Yes. 
the right one depends on the, how the shape looks like. Exactly. So there's something in the help. Here's the help button. It opens the help in this window itself. And here you have some discussion about these tools. Yeah, you see here, remove, break, and so on. And you can go there and you can figure out tool snap. The tool snap does this and that. Remove duplicate area centroids. Yeah, and so on. You can find it out like that. Or I don't understand the question. Yes. I would, uh, I would like to see the shape to know what is the right uh, uh, thing to do. Right. Yeah, as I mentioned, the VCLEAN can uh, write out an error map, this one here, name mm -hmm. of map where errors are written to. Uh, okay. That you display and then you know where the problem is, <laughs> right? So personally, I'm a big fan of raster data because you don't bother with all this topology stuff. Um, good. Okay. Uh, I think I will skip these basic commands here. Uh, the import you have also here, what I did already for you. Uh, we can also manage some metadata there. And now we want to import uh, the... The, the sorry the raster map which isn't there so if I do G list raster you see there's nothing because we didn't import it yet and we have uh, you already extracted it one map called LF something tiff that's a geo tiff G dal info map name is showing you the metadata. I think you get, will be familiar with that. Um, all right, so now we want to import that. In this example, we use R in GDAL, but you can also use um, R.import. So maybe I use R import. Import input equal elevation, and you see I'm pretty fast because I just hit continuously the tab key. Output equal, now I'm super lazy and do a trick, I use elevation again just to have the word there and take off the TIFF because this will be the name in the grass database. It shouldn't have TIFF, it's not TIFF anymore. And then I hit import and voila, we are there. And we can assign a color table to it done to just show you uh, that we have beautiful color tables here it is in the GUI you can see already the, the rendered examples in my view the I don't know what Saga does but QGIS doesn't have such uh, nice color tables for whatever reason we even invited them to steal them from us but they didn't um, there are a lot of uh, thematic color tables here Growing degree days, Fahrenheit, uh, vegetation index, specific maps for SRTM, uh, and so on, population maps. And why is this special or important? Uh, imagine you display a population map, you know, especially in, with mega cities, you have nothing around, and then suddenly one million people living somewhere, and then nothing again. So these color tables here are already prepared for that, and they show you nicely... Um, also those areas which are not very populated so that you get a contrast. You can write your own, of course, but if you are in a hurry, just take those one here. Okay. Um, we have done already vector display. Now we go for raster display. There's an icon here. This one. You load the raster map. Say OK, and then we see here a subset of the, this is the European ECAT uh, elevation model, which is the base for these climatic data. We can also have um, a legend. Add, it's here uh, on, over them. There are different map tools, map display tools like Zoom, Pan, 
and so forth. And there's Rasta legend as well. It picks already the map which is highlighted in the legend. And you can additionally um, add, for example, under the gradient here, you can add a histogram to the smooth legend. And now you have here close the legend. With the pointer tool, you can also move it around. And you can immediately see here the distribution according to the color table. If you want to modify, just double click and you get back to this dialog here. And if you want to not see the legend anymore, right click it and there's remove legend. And the legend is gone. Okay, same thing with arrow and text and so forth. We will skip that. And now we want to do um, some time series processing. And now it comes to this famous uh, computational region. Because you can see in the display that we have a red line around it. Probably it depends on the grass version. The older ones didn't show it, but you can activate it here. This is the current computational region, but you see the areas are different and it's for sure not the global extent. Oh no, sorry, I'm wrong, it's the full one. What I'm telling, it's not the full one. Uh, maybe I have to switch it on, really. Show computational, this one it is, I think. Yeah, so it's the same, you have a switch here. Ah, okay, sorry, I know now what I did. Um, so if I want full view, then I use the global map. But the computational region is at time as big as the globe here. If I go to the elevation map, click right, mouse button here, there's some entry which is called set computational region from selected map. So, why this? Because it's pointless if we do not, if we want to compute things uh, in the area of interest, which is Europe in this case, because our ICAT data are here, it's pointless to do no data computation in the rest of the world. It's just a waste of time and resources. So I want to set it to the area of interest, which is defined by this map. You see, it switched from global to this area. Now all subsequent computation is done here. It is simply ignoring what is outside. And this is, this is the power of this computational region. If you just, I told you before, want only Münster and you have a gigabyte area, you just zoom to it, but you also tell it, okay, now continue computation there in the so-called computational region using this way. No, because um, what would that be? If you have if you, you think this and this, for example, right? Um, what you would do is to set it to the entire one, which covers both areas, but then you can use the mask to get rid of these parts here. It's a kind of compromise, let's say. Computation, uh, not, let's say, but from the software side, it's too difficult to, to implement arbitrary computational regions because that's just too complicated. If you have, for example, the global SRTM on your disk, which is heavy, you would put it to the permanent map set, then it's visible to all the other map sets there. And the other map sets are maybe project oriented, one is in Europe, one is in Africa, one is in Asia, and so forth. Um, but they all happily read from this uh, big one in the, in the permanent map set, yet only use the selected computational region. Okay, so um, we have also another way of setting the region. Maybe I should have set the Windows users 
if you are, uh, if is everybody equipped with a command line there? Apparently, yes. You also have the console here. The, this one um, is the same thing, more or less. It comes with some intelligence, kind of. If you type, it already gives you the selection. So you can more quickly type here as well. And then raster equal, uh, what was it? I don't remember, but I have it somewhere. No. Ah, there's one. Ah, okay, I know. Mm, we have to do one more step first. So we are at time in the in the um, in the map set permanent, right? You are probably still there. If you write g dot map sets with s minus p for print, it will show you the uh, accessible map sets, and that's only permanent. We can switch on the fly. Uh, you can also see the list of uh, available map sets with minus L. Or if you want to see it graphically with minus S for show, it opens a dialog, and there you have um, the map sets to which are available here. So the data I'm interested in, they are in a different map set because the idea is to keep things a bit organized. Don't throw everything into the same folder. This also applies here. And in grass uh, speech, it means use different map sets. We can switch the map set on the fly using G map set without S. And then map set name is uh, ICAT 17. So we jump into the other map set right now because we want to be where our data are. I think in the tutorial I said uh, uh, get out of grass, get into grass, but now we just do a hot jump and now we are in a different map set. Yes, exactly. So in, if I run again the list of raster maps, now I will see many, because these map sets, uh, sorry, these maps are stored in the ACAT 17 map set and not in the permanent. So if you are not yet there, G map set without S, map set equal ACAT brings us into the other directory. Do you got that, more or less? Other way is leave grass, go in, and from the graphical screen, take it. But this is, of course, much faster, as you can notice. All right. Um, settings here. This one. There's an entry under settings, grass working environment. There's also the computational region stuff. And then change working environment. This is what we have just done. And you can see from the menu, if you are searching for some functionality and you don't know what the command name is, you see it right away. And another chance is here under the modules tab. You have it organized and you can also do a full text search. So you know something with map set, enter, and it brings you there. You, with enter, you can cycle. It's also written there what commands you have related to map set. So that is under modules. And from here, you can call them. OK, now I want to do some, um, some listing. So the first listing we had was the full listing. You can see there's a lot. You are maybe presented with some more here. It just stops when the screen is full to see to get more. 
you press either space or you go with page up and page down. I think you can also scroll. No, you cannot. And if you want to get out of this, you can press Q for quit. I think it's also written somewhere in the tutorial. But this is way too many maps here. So we can do some filtering and we use a pattern. GList pattern pattern uh, equal precipitation something and then we use a star and show only the sums of this block here. And you see, you see get only the subset. And why is this relevant? If you do time series processing then you naturally want only to have some subset of the data in your time series analysis and with these patterns you can uh, filter that quite easily. So we can also store this in a file. So it's a bit longer. We write it out into a CSV file. What does it do? GList, or maybe I highlight with the mouse. GList, the raster maps, use this pattern here, what we define, and write the results instead of showing it, write it to a file. Done. Now you have here a file, which is this one. That is a common CSV file. It doesn't have many columns, only one, but it, is, it behaves like a CSV. And now we can do a time series computation and we give this as an input and the output we define as annual sums because we use the method sum. So what happens here? Yes. I will tell you. Same question? The syntax? Yeah, it's fairly easy. It is input, output. What you can do, you can even re you can shuffle the order as you wish. Grass comes with a pretty clever parser and it can understand what is meant. So like GDAL tools, it's really order matters, but here it doesn't. If you miss a parameter which is needed, yeah, I do this. Um, I didn't put the method, so it shows you the help instead of doing something. And here it says error, required parameter method not set. And so you know. So it does also error checking. Now, what does this R series do? Uh, you have seen we had a list of maps, which are, what was it? Let's look at them once more. Ah, sorry. So we had here the precipitation maps. These are monthly sums over this, these 30 years. So this is a preparation I had already done in the past for you because you get daily data if you get the originals and aggregated them on a monthly base to sums. And now we want to have uh, even more sum on top of that. If you want to know how, to, how these data were done, you get, can also do the raster history, but it is not so exciting. Um, uh, this is not that detailed. Okay. Now we go to this uh, command here. Our series is taking this list and does something with it. And this something is defined with method. So the summary in this case is just summing up pixel by pixel in the stack um, the, the results, uh, sorry, the input pixels and writes out the result. So from many data, you get one. Yes, you can write input is map 1, map 2, map 3, and so on. Uh, you can also do same thing. But the change is here it is called file equal, and this is called input equal. And if you are lost, just put help, and you see here input, uh, name of raster maps, can be one or many, 
file with input file with one map name or more. You can even put for the more complex tools here, if you want to have some weighted computation, you can even put the weight as a second column there, and it knows how to weigh the individual uh, layers there in this file. So here are all the univariate statistics. Uh, there are also quartiles and skewness, and what is especially nice, uh, if you have this stack of, say, monthly data, and you want to know in each pixel when occurred the maximum. So in this case, we have 12 months. Yeah, you want to know uh, for each pixel in which month the maximum of precipitation occurred. You can, um, you can use this count and min raster or max raster tools, and it will write out not the value, like the accumulated precipitation, but the number of the map in the stack. And since it corresponds here in this case to the month, you know, okay, in this pixel it was in June, in that pixel it was, so month number six, in that pixel it was in month number 11. Yeah, and like this you can quite uh, quickly in one line uh, even figure out when happened what. And since it is even better, you can also combine all those and do it all in one. Say, I want the average, the sums, min and max, and also know when min and max happened. So you just do, um, where are the methods here? Here, method, you can have several methods. And then naturally you must define several output maps which correspond in the order. So it's quite powerful, I believe. I show you. No? So we have, let's say, I go back to my file example. Yeah, file is CSV file with the 12 entries. Output is, okay, let's reorder this. Sum and average, well, how was it written? Average, I think. Yeah, we can imagine. And then uh, <coughs> the output follows. <coughs> So I'm super lazy <coughs> and do, okay, sorry. Fast command line editing, select, insert, insert once more, average, average. So what I did, our series, list of input, two methods and one to output maps. So it will write the sum into the first and the average into the second. And like this you can make it pretty long, still it's only one line. In the manual page of our series, uh, you find examples for that. So we can colorize it. I assign the precipitation color table, which is already there. And now we want to look at it. I load it here into the display. It will be somewhere here. How did I call it? Annual sum, I think this one. So we can zoom to it using this zoom tool. Maybe we switch off the vector for now. Elevation we also don't need. Okay, and so this was this the map I was creating. Yeah. Okay, same thing with temperature, and you can imagine how it works. Here's the example of the temperature. So these are annual mean temperatures in this uh, 30 years here. And now we are uh, getting closer to the next one. Uh, if you take the fresh data, you find them back usually up to six months ago, everything is there. So you can really start now to compare 1950 to uh, 81, uh, 80, 81 to 2010 and 2010 onwards. Aggregate like this in three lines. You have the three stacks aggregated to three maps and then do some analysis on how things evolved pixel-wise over time. Okay, some univariate statistics. Um, 
Yes. If uh, date pixels are missing, you mean? Yeah, yeah, that is missing. No problem. Um, it does what is statistically sensible, which means, like here in the C, we do not have data. There's already no data in this case. It can do null propagation or it cannot do null propagation. It depends on your uh, use case, so to say. Mm. Okay, now I do go into the manual, r.series. So you see it here, propagate nulls. This is not the default. It really depends on what you want. For example, if you are stacking data and you have uh, one pixel which is not there, but the others are there in this column, uh, then it can be that you like it or it can be that you do not like it. Yeah, but with the minus n flag, you can define which behavior you prefer. If uh, the null is propagated, means the entire column will be erased in the output. Or if you just jump over it and you say, okay, I don't care. For my statistics, it doesn't matter. So it comes up with the, the statistics of what is uh, there in that column. So you can choose from. And the null is the, as the NA in the R? Yes. So null is no data. We have the zero, like zero degrees Celsius, and the null, which is no data, or NA. There's also a tool for that called r.null uh, uh, in which you can define, imagine, so let's say old, old days uh, geodata came with minus 9,999 as representation for no data. You, some of you may remember uh, because they were not really able back then to code that somehow. Um, if you know this value should really be no data, you use r.null, name, uh, name of the map, and then set null equal minus 9999. And then it goes off, disappears. It's no longer such a value, but it become no data, becomes no data. Which is quite important in case you have these decks and you forget about it. Yeah, you will find some funny results because it treats it like a normal number. But nowadays, I think it's more or less a non-problem. Okay, univariate statistics. Um, very easy, r.univar is doing raster univariate statistics. We also have v.univar if you want to do this on vector data. And they're either on vector attributes or on the geometry, like statistics on area sizes and so forth. And when you run it, then you get here the results, mean marks, quartiles, and the common stuff. So now something about vector data. So I look at the vector data here, um, and there's a command which is called show me something from the database, vector database select. And it happily prints everything, which is a lot, but um, you can naturally use some tool here, which is this one. So we go here, right mouse button, uh, there's somewhere What is it? Attribute table thing? Ah, yeah, here. Show attribute data. And then, then you will see them uh, in a normal table style. And here you also have the possibility to do selections. Select from which column and the uh, operator and then what you want to select. Show me only Münster, for example. Okay, will not be there, but anyway. Uh, and there's also a builder where you can create more complex uh, tables, uh, sorry, queries. Here it is, really. So those who are familiar with QGS, they will uh, remember it is quite similar. And then we also have the possibility here to manage tables, which means this is the connection between geometry and attributes but I will not go into details here, just you know where it is. Oh, 
All right. Um, I will jump over this part because I think it's pretty clear. If you read it again. Um, so I think, so we have to do another sum if we want to do... Um, Which one did we do? Ah, yeah, we did the other one. I just copy select now two commands here and bring them into the command line. We do the same uh, annual summary which we had done before. So we have now two of them. And to find them pre pre uh, quickly back, I use the G list Rust with pattern, something which is star annual su. I was too lazy to write some star, and it will show both of them. Now we have two aggregated stacks, 30 years and 30 years. Just for completeness, we also assign the color table. I skip over the univariate statistics, and now we do a map algebra. I copy it from here. Um, okay, R dot map calc is the algebra algebraic tool, and here it is like the output is equal to the formula. So means in this case we say each pixel uh, subtract from uh, ninety fifty to eighty sums the period of eighty one to two thousand ten. Okay, done. And then we have a very nice uh, differences color table here. Color table differences already prepared. And now we can look at the result. Switch off this one. And now we see the differences here. So we don't see, don't know what it means. So we pick also a legend. Sorry, wrong one. Raster legend. Gradient. Add histogram. Apply. Okay, and so here we see differences. These are millimeter uh, of annual uh, precipitation. What's your opinion on this result? So it's a lot centered around zero, which is maybe reasonable, but there are quite some differences as well. So 680 millimeter of difference in annual precipitation is something what the city of Hanover receives in a year or other places as well. Uh, we can use this to find artifacts in the data because this looks pretty strange here. Yeah, I don't think this is true. And you will only find such things if you do aggregation over time. You have seen it's very easy. You take the stack, you shrink it to something reasonable like sums, you compare different periods, and you see apparently something happened. So maybe here in the Alps, we can say, okay, probably the uh, rainfall pattern changed really over 60 years, quite possible. Uh, maybe also here, maybe here, yes, no, we don't know. But we have some spurious, apparently pixel-wise, strange things here. And if you look at the eCut website, you find similar maps there, where they always, with the new version they publish every six months, show, oops, here was a mistake, and we have fixed it. Shifted metrological stations, for example, uh, in the past, they were just all shifted. Now, this is, of course, a big mess, but it happens. Um, and so be critical with your data. Do apply such things, and then you can find out if the data are clean or not. Yes. Yeah. Um, so we had uh, one now. If you like, we do one last command. Is that okay? I mean, I don't I can go on. I have no problems with that, but uh, maybe you want to go for lunch. I will tell you so uh, in a moment. Yeah. 
Yes. Uh, it's called r.external. And so here you say name of output map, external map, input, and here you pick uh, the map you have, like um, geodata, a card. Maybe you now we externally map it, this elevation model. And you say run and ready. Now it is there. And if I go to the map display, I called it external map. It should be in the list. External map here. OK. And I don't see anything cool. Uh, I would ex have expected to see it now. Well, no idea. Um, should be there. Yeah, I did. Weird. Okay, that's the like the stage effect or something like that. Mm. Yeah, whatever. Imagine it was there. Um, not sure why it is not. Okay, so the last last command here. Maybe I just show you because we are really running out of time. Um, here I was taking country boundaries. There's also another map we have somewhere. And then doing uh, aggregation by, by country. Yeah, you could imagine you want to know it country-wise, not this global generic thing. Um, and that is called re, uh, zonal statistics. And this tool, r.univar, is also able to do that. So you remember we had computed the differences map just before. And then you give the zones here, and it writes out um, a table, a CSV file, basically telling for each country what the value is, aggregated over the pixels falling into the polygon. Yeah, so you have country A, value, country B, value, and this is a CSV table. And this you can then display. This is the super fancy... Um, LibreOffice, I mean R, shouldn't you say, you use R, of course, why not? And then you can just do funny displays like this. You order it by country and by uh, difference here in precipitation, and you see who are gainers or who are not. Just eye candy or you get eye blind, uh, it's up to you. But uh, in the end, you can then do, based on this, all kinds of statistics. And of course, the result you have done in a few lines, so basically four lines, uh, aggregation, differences, and zonal statistics, okay, only three. You can then load into R. So you just, as uh, Vero said, you start R here, library, and so on, uh, uh, Rgras 7, and then you fetch it into it. Now you can exchange data and continue with your analysis. So we have now like minus three minutes left for all the rest. Uh, we will not really make it. But this, uh, let's say, the material available here is definitely more than uh, we uh, than for two hours. Just to show what uh, was happening here, what would be happening here, we do then point sampling. So we use the maps we have. We do random sampling there, uh, kind of simulating meteorological stations. And then we do uh, uh, saving of that. And we run the machine learning in order to, um, sorry, to, yeah, to look into the calculation. I just searched for the code. I thought it was there. Mm. Yeah, there is a file somewhere. I don't know where the link. If you are work with such a huge font on the screen, you don't see anything anymore. But I have it, of course, here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this one. So there's a file in the repository, which is this exercise. I didn't want to write it as a text, too much work uh, and useless. So we have it here in the, in the directory. There must be the link somewhere.
yeah, we have some auxiliary data which are naturally needed. No, what was the name? Okay. Oh, Copen typo. Uh, Köppen Geiger tells you uh, like climatic zones. This is um, Arctic. This is uh, Sub-Saharan. I just invent some names. There's the real legend. And if you want to do metal, uh, machine learning, you have also to tell it something. Look, this one would be called like that, and this one would be called like that. And uh, in order to uh, have some base data, I extracted this table here, and this you then uh, feed into the model. You import it. If you have looked closely, we have coordinates here. So you know these are the sampling positions of particular climates. This we import as a vector map um, using um, V in ASCII, read from ASCII file, and write out a vector map. So this you then display. And then we go through, do some extractions and some random sampling. Um, I think it should be detailed, quite detailed enough here. Then we assign with the table join the different classes, do some colors, and then eventually we go to this uh, classification step. We also we need some auxiliary variables like uh, elevation values, which we retrieve at the position of what we know from the auxiliary maps, like the elevation model. And uh, then we do a rasterization because the tool we use here, R dot learn machine learning, it wants raster input. So we kind of rasterize these points into different layers. And this we then